Hello and welcome to my next video on genetic engineering. So, scientists often refer to the processes involved in genetic engineering as recombinant DNA technology. It's because recombinant DNA means you've got DNA from more than one organism. Now, in genetic er engineering, you need the following steps. You need to obtain the required gene. You need to get a copy of the gene and place it in a vector. The vector must carry the gene to the recipient cell and the re recipient must express the gene through protein synthesis. Now on page 174 of your textbooks they give you um, stages in engineering processes and methods possible. We look at lots of these in a lot more detail later or certain ones in a lot more detail. You can read them but those aren't too important. It's the next step, well next things that are. Restriction enzymes which I'm calling RE and ligase which are LE. Now, restriction enzyme is just an enzyme that can cut something, or cut DNA. Now, restriction enzyme is also known as restriction endonucleases, and they cut through DNA at specific points. Now, each, each restriction enzyme has a very specific few bases it will cut. And, well, it doesn't have to be a few bases, it can be a number of bases. But, well, it's usually less than 10 bases long. Sorry, it's usually less than 10 bases long. But the restriction enzymes will cut these. Ligase enzymes seal them together. Now, so a specific restriction enzyme cuts DNA to specific points, producing sticky ends. A sticky end is formed when DNA is cut. It's a short run of unpaired exposed bases seen at the end of the cut section. Complementary sticky ends can stick together. Now this is why it's important, if you use the same restriction enzyme on two different bits of DNA, it means you will have the same bases exposed. Which means those two bases are complementary, or those sections of bases are complementary, so they can be joined together using ligase enzymes. And that is basically what the importance of this is. This is how genetic engineering works. And another thing, restriction enzymes generally hydrolyze the bonds, li um, di ligase enzymes will to go through a condensation reaction and condense the bonds. Now the bases will naturally go together with those um, hydrogen bond pairings. The ligase just does the, the phosphate sugar backbone. Now some basics. Why do we want to have genetic engineering anyway? Well, two main reasons. Improving features of the recipient organism and we'll look at one form of both of these. Now this is to make an organism, you know, just better in general. So perhaps you want to get resistance of some sort of disease or pest in a plant. So you might transfer a gene in. The other sort is for synthesizing products. So if you want to create a hormone, you'll genetically engineer something like a bacteria and it will produce the compound for you. Now we use bacterial plasmids a lot because they're very useful. What you can do is you can cut the plasmid using a restriction enzyme, then cut the gene which you want with that same restriction enzyme. So you make sure you find the right restriction enzyme for that gene and use it on the plasmid and the gene so you get the gene you want. You then, since they've now got sticky ends which are complementary, you can stick them together using ligase. So you've now got that gene in the plasmid. And this is recombinant DNA. You put it in a bacterial cell and it will then replicate and you'll get that bacteria producing the compound you want. Now, when a bacteria takes up a plasmid DNA, they become transformed and are transgenic. And any organism is described as transgenic when it contains DNA that has been added to its cells as a result of genetic engineering. Now, plasmids will pick up, I'm um, sorry, bacteria will pick up plasmids. So if you put a solution of uh, bacteria in a solution of the plasmids you want, some of them will pick up. Even so, this process is actually quite inefficient. Less than a quarter of 1% of bacterial cells will take up a plasmid. Those that do are known to transform bacteria and they're transgenic. But the important thing is that bacteria can do something else, which we look at next. And this is conjugation or bacterial conjugation. And this is when genetic material is exchanged. Plasmids are copied and passed between bacteria. So as you can see, there's a bacteria that has no plasmid and one that has a plasmid. They join together, and that bit in between is called a conjugation tube. Then, the plasmid splits in two, 
So one bit will stay inside the original cell, the other bit will go into the new cell, and then through replication, they will get a fully formed plasmid in both, and you've kind of doubled it. So that means if you've got plasmids in some bacteria, as we said, a quarter of a percent, now that means you can then transfer it between a lot of the bacteria as well. Why this is a problem, however, is that this can, let's say you get a, re a resistant strain of bacteria to antibiotics, and that was the MRSA, and that's methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And then they can transfer all their plasmids to other bacteria, which means you get loads of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So that's a problem with it. Right. But now we're going to look at the good, the good things you can do with bacteria. And that is the, the old biological favourite, the production of insulin. I'm not going to go through all the basic stuff from GCC about insulin, you know, going, well, you know, you have pig insulin originally, but that's not as good, higher chance of rejection, all that, so it's best to use this. I'm going to go through the actual reasonably complicated process. So, due to space, I'll kind of skip step, I'll explain it. You have your original gene, and that's the one that has, in a human, will code for insulin. Now, they actually used mRNA because DNA is a lot harder to find. There are 300 million bases and you have to find just the ones that do insulin. It's quite hard because every cell will contain the same information. All cells will have the code to make insulin. It's just only certain ones will actually do it because they've turned on. So that's hard. What you do do is you go into the cells which do make insulin, which as you'll remember is the, is the uh, beta cells in the islets of Langerhans in the uh, uh, pancreas and you find the mRNA and take that but you can't use mRNA you have to turn it into DNA so you get mRNA and use something called reverse transcriptase now when you are transcribing DNA it produces an mRNA strand this does the opposite you have an mRNA strand turns it to DNA and then you treat it with DNA polymerase and produces something called C DNA, which are copies of the human insulin gene. Now you add the addition of DNA polymerase and also the supply of DNA nucleotides mean you get a second strand built, just as in DNA replication, so you've got a full DNA strand. Now unpaired nucleotides are added at the end to give sticky end, which will be complementary to those of the cut plasmid you're going to use. So we've now got E. coli, you remove the plasmid from E. coli, and then you cut it open using a restriction enzyme at a specific point, and we'll look at what point it is a bit later. You can then splice the cDNA with the um, plasmid that has sticky ends, and this will be using DNA ligase to produce a plasmid with the human insulin gene. You place it into E. coli, and it will start you know, taking up um, the plasmid and swapping it with others. You can also just leave the plasmids floating in the solution, and they will be picked up. The bacteria are then grown on an agar plate where each bacterial cell grows to produce a mound of identical cloned cells called a colony. Now, you have to identify these. We've just made the insulin gene in for the bacteria, the E. coli, but there's a problem. Not all bacteria take up the plasmid. There are three possibilities. Some bacteria will not have taken up the plasmid at all. Some bacteria will have taken up a plasmid that has not sealed in a copy of the gene but sealed up on itself to reform the original plasmid. Because remember, what you do is you're putting basically a solution of the cut open plasmid and the human insulin gene. They have sticky ends, but they're not always going to go for each other. Sometimes ligase will just seal up the plasmid. But the others, the ones we want, will have taken up the recombinant plasmid, and these will be the transformed bacteria. But, you know, using your eyes, you can't look at them. Now, I personally think this is really clever how this works. What you do is the plasmid that has been chosen for the human insulin gene has something called genetic markers. And these are two resistances to certain antibiotics. And the two antibiotics chemicals are ampicillin and tetracycline. I know I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry, but yeah. that's how But I've called them here amp-R, amp-resistance, and tet-resistance. Now, 
the place you cut into in the plasmid is right in between the tet resistant gene and you insert the insulin gene there. Now if you do that it means instantly the tet resistant gene won't work. So we now have a plasmid that has the working insulin gene, a working AMP resistant gene and a non-working tet resistant gene because it's split in two. We now do a process called replica plating. Now the bacteria are grown on standard nutrient agar so the bacterial cells grow. You then take a sample of these and transfer them onto an agar plate that's been made with ampicillin. Now, the ones that haven't taken up this plasmid because they didn't have it before will not have ampicillin resistance, so they will die. The ones that do have the insulin plasmid will have ampicillin resistance, so they will live and they will grow. You then take a sample of these colonies and put them on a tet agar plate. One has uh, tetracycline. Now, what this means is the ones that have insulin will not have a working tetra tet resistant gene. So they're going to die, meaning the only ones that are left are the ones that have the plasmid and have both the AMP and the tet resistant gene. They don't have the human insulin gene. And what you then do is you can keep a track of which colony is which. And then if you just compare the ampicillin resistant ag the ampicillin agar plate and the tetracycline agar plate you will see which ones died and it's the ones that died will have the insulin gene because they don't have a tetra a tet resistant gene so let's say you have a b c d e f g and h colonies on the ampicillin agar if you look at the tetracycline you only have a b c and d or e f g and h or however many i said those ones will have died so those ones must have not have a non-functioning tet gene tet resistant gene so they must have the human insulin gene so that's the ones you want you can now identify those colonies take them and grow them on normal agar on a large scale and then they will start producing insulin and you can harvest that our second example is golden rice now the one we just looked at was one where you're genetically engineering something to get a useful product this one is to improve it and why is because gold normal rice has a gene which can code for something called beta carotene, which is a um, a pigment found in plants. Now it's normally found in normal rice, but in the bit we eat, which is um, I can't remember what, um, the endosperm. That's what it's called. Um, it's switched off, so we don't get it. Beta carotene is really good in getting vitamin A. Vitamin A is good for eyesight, cell growth and development, um, getting epithelial tissue, bones. Well, it's good for many number of things. And a lot of people in the world have vitamin A deficiency, particularly in Africa and Southeast Asia. So it'd be really good if we could get something which could provide vitamin A, especially because rice is grown in so many countries. So there's a way you can get golden rice. Now, all you need to do is just be able to turn the gene on. And the way you do that is actually reasonably complex, but most of the enzymes to the pathway, which is quite complex, are already present. But it's two you need to add. And these two genes are the phy phytoene synthase enzyme and the CRT1 enzyme. Now, the, phy um, the phytoene synth synthase is the gene that was extracted from daffodils, and the CRT1 enzyme was extracted from the soil bacterium Awinia eridovera. And what, and see what happens. You have the precursor molecules, you add photoene synthase, which surprisingly synthesizes photoene. You then add CRT1 enzyme and you get lycopene. If you add the enzymes already present in the rice endosperm, so you don't add them, they're already there, it will then create beta carotene. Now, one thing to look at, and it's something to research more than just do it, um, for me to teach it, is have a look at how successful it actually was, because it's been questioned whether it was successful or not. So have a look. Now that is all the examples um, you need to know about genetic engineering, but we're now going to look at gene therapy. And um, this is used to help many genetic disorders which people have. And there are two main types, somatic gene therapy and germline. Uh, cell gene therapy. Now somatic gene therapy just means of body cells because somatic cells are body cells and germline mean the sex cells. Now two main ways you can do with somatic body cells um, is you have addition of genes, that's augmentation. 
Some conditions are caused by the inheritance of faulty alleles leading to the loss of functional gene products. Engineering a functional copy of the gene into the relevant specialised cell means that the polypeptide is synthesised and the cell can function normally. And then if you kill uh, cells and kill genes, uh, cancers can be treated by eliminating certain populations of cells using genetic techniques to make cancerous cells express genes to produce pro proteins such as cell surface antigens. You can make them vulnerable to attack by the immune system so they'll be destroyed. Now... Germline gene therapy is just to do with the sex cells. If you can, if there are inherited diseases and you can get it straight from birth, when all these cells specialise, they will have the correct genes. But this is currently illegal because people say that it is, you know, you could create a new human disease or interfere with human evolution, prevent modifications to the human genome in or permanent modification to the human genome. Sorry, in this way, raise difficult moral, ethical, and social issues that need to be fully debated. And we'll look at these issues in a second, but. One thing to mention about all types of gene therapy is if they correct a gene, these genes so far have only been working on recessive genetic disorders. So if you add a new gene or a new allele, remember dominant always means that the dominant one will show through. So you could have perhaps a thousand recessive ones and one dominant, the dominant will show through. So if you add a dominant gene into a recessive disorder like cystic fibrosis, it will go. If you have a dominant disorder though, then you have a problem. Now, yet again, this is much or something that's just easier to read, but I'm going to go through the the issues concerning gene therapy. So firstly, somatic cell gene therapy. The functional allele of the gene is introduced into target cells, therefore techniques to get the gene to the target location are needed. Introduction into somatic cells means that any treatment is short-lived and has to be repeated regularly because the cells will not pass it on when they divide. So once you've got a division of cells, it's gone forever. There are difficulties in getting the allele into the genome in a functioning state. Genetically modified viruses have been tried, but the host becomes immune to them, so cells will not accept the virus vector. Liposomes are used, but they may be inefficient. Now, liposomes are kind of artific artificial vesicles. So they can pass through the plasma membrane of the target cell, and then give the gene into the kind of, you know, into the cell. And genetic manipulations are restricted to the actual patient. In germline cell gene therapy, the function of the gene is introduced into germline cells. Delivery techniques are more straightforward, so that's good. The introduction into germline cells means that all cells derived from those germline cells will contain a copy of the function allele. The offspring may also contain the allele. Although more straightforward, it is considered unethical to engineer human embryos. It is not possible to know whether the allele has been successfully introduced without any unintentional changes to it, which may damage the embryo. And genetic manipulations can be passed on to the patient's children. Now, basically, it is saying that germline is much more successful, but it's more ethically questionable. That's why it is illegal. Somatic um, works, but only for a short period of time and can be a little bit harder to do. And then the next double spread of this module is about ethical, you know, is it right or wrong to do this? So that is something else which is just easier to read than me explain them, and it's common sense anyway, so I'm sure you know what the ethical dilemmas are. If you want to go over that, please email me. It's just with these videos, I don't want to make them incredibly long. I want to get everything in which is important. I don't miss things out and just, you know, not tell you. But if there's anything like in this video and the ecosystems one, which is very simple, it's just common sense really, I will just say, look, go research that. If you need any help, come and see me purely because it saves time for me recording it so it means I can spend more time focusing on the harder stuff and it also saves you time so you don't need to listen to all this stuff if you already know it. I hope, I hope that's fine with you. If you want me to add this stuff in, I'd be happy to. So conclusion, you have recombinant DNA which is from more than one species. You use bacterial plasmids and the examples we need to know about is insulin and golden rice and you use gene therapy to cure genetic disorders and this is genetic engineering. So thank you for watching. Comment, like, subscribe. Any questions, ask me. Um, please tell me how you think the recent videos have been. If there's any problems, tell me how I can change them. If you like them, make sure I know you like them so I can continue. And thank you for watching and goodbye.